It's Monday, March 28, 2022. In the headlines, Senate approves appropriation bill. Education Minister addresses violence in schools. Minister of Finance and Public Service Dr. Nigel Clark elected as chair of the Board of Governors of the IDB. Regionally, National Security Minister cautions citizens about taking photos and videos of police officers while on duty. And in sports, West Indies wins Apex Test Series. This is the news on PBCJ. I am Simone Absalom Gale. The Senate on Friday approved the Appropriation Bill 2022, which outlines how the government will spend the $912 billion allocated in the 2022-2023 estimates of expenditure. Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce, Senator Alvin Hill, who piloted the legislation, said the government has presented an appropriation bill that takes care of people. The $40 billion spent, 26.4 of which is for health, is a huge spend, government showing what it means. So how can we really, how can you really argue, uh, Senator Crawford, that we have not targeted the needy? Not, not possible. The money the government will spend for the upcoming fiscal year is comprised of non-debt recurrent expenditure of $539.5 billion capital expenditure of $65.1 billion, and debt servicing of $307.5 billion. Senator Hill promised the new buses will be here shortly. I can confirm to you that 50 buses have been ordered and they're going to be on their way very soon, and that is coming forward to make sure that we, we, we subscribe and, and fit the commitment that we made. The bill was approved in the House of Representatives on Tuesday, March 22, following the closure of the budget debate. Jamaica's Minister of Finance and the Public Service, Dr. Nigel Clark, was elected as a chair of the Board of Governors of the Inter-American Development Bank, the IDB, on Monday. Minister Clark, in his response, said he is grateful for the opportunity. He notes that Jamaica has been a member of the IDB since 1962. He says the country remains committed to being active and engaged as a member of the IDB, as the IDB is Jamaica's largest creditor. The IDB, as Jamaica's largest creditor, has played an integral role in supporting our growth and development objectives. In particular, however, I must use this opportunity to thank the IDB for its tremendous support to Jamaica as we pursued an ambitious program of economic reform over the past several years. As a result of these reforms, Jamaica has entrenched macroeconomic stability and fiscal sustainability, and we are better equipped to deal with unforeseen external shocks. Dr. Clark says Jamaica looks forward to deepening its partnership with the IDB as we continue to recover and reform, and as we seek to position ourselves as an economy that is open and ready for private sector investment that can catalyze sustainable and inclusive growth, even as we pursue public investments geared towards human capital, social, and infrastructure development. The newly elected IDB Board of Governors Chair says he recognizes the institution's commitment to deepening its partnership within a Latin America and a Caribbean region. It is critical that the bank leverages its strong presence in the region to support our countries in addressing issues such as sustainable growth, digitalization, poverty reduction and social protection, gender equality, human capital development, economic resilience, and climate change vulnerability. The COVID-19 pandemic eroded the hard-earned gains of several countries in the region. It also exacerbated pre-existing vulnerabilities and development challenges such as high inequality, high poverty, high debt, and low growth that existed throughout much of our region. 
Jamaica's Central Bank has been named the winner of the Central Banking Publications Communications Initiative Award 2021. The winning entry, centrally speaking, is the Bank of Jamaica's flagship television production that facilitates conversations around important matters of economics and finance that have an impact on the people of Jamaica. The judges noted that the talk show aired on Television Jamaica, quote, demonstrated ambitious scale, wide reach, and strong integration with the Central Bank's program of monetary policy communication, end quote. This is the second time that the bank has won this prestigious award. In 2019, the winning entry was the reggae-inspired communication strategy that introduced the bank's inflation target of 46%. More than 35,000 primary school students successfully completed the ability test component of their primary exit profile exams last Thursday. Education and Youth Minister Favel Williams praised the students for their determination to complete that step, despite the challenges faced due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Minister Williams was speaking at a press brief on the weekend where she also addressed the recent incidents of violence in schools. We have more in this report. According to the Education Minister, students from both public and private primary institutions sat the ability test across 1,052 centers. These are our students who will be making their way to our high schools come September of this year. Let us pray for them. They, they would have had the greatest fallout in terms of learning loss. She says schools provided about 369 special accommodations for special needs students. That included giving extra time for the test, assigning readers or writers, prompters or shadows, giving preferential seating in the exam center, making allowance for breaks during the exam, uh, giving interpreters to students whose first language is not English, she explains that four students requested to sit the test while in hospital. Addressing the recent incidents of violence in several schools, Minister Williams says her officers are now on high alert. Since the resumption of face-to-face -face classes, five schools have come to national attention with reports of violence involving students. We would have had a virtual meeting with principals in our schools to go through these situations, to talk through it, to remind them of uh, some of the strategies, initiatives that we would expect to see on, you know, in our schools to increase the safety and security of all, not just our students, but our administrators or school leaders in school. Minister Without Portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Senator Matthew Samuda, says the Forestry Department has passed its 1 million trees threshold in the 3 million trees, 3 years initiative. He says with the help of the public, the initiative which began in October 2019 has seen more than a million trees planted across Jamaica. However, he told members of the Senate on Friday that more help is needed to make the initiative a complete success. We've also launched a GIS application that will allow those who choose to participate with us to put the app on their phone and to help us identify the location of these trees so that we don't have to go out and verify each step, but rather the forestry officers per parish can take the time and work through that space. So that's another major achievement for us, Mr. President. The objective of the project is to have Jamaica make a voluntary contribution towards global climate resilience. Using the country's population figure as a guideline, the goal is for at least one tree to be planted for every Jamaican on both private and public lands. The planting is one aspect of the process. Forestry Department says the seedlings also need to be maintained for a while before they can be self-sufficient. Senator Samuda says there are also plans to incorporate a proposed initiative relative to the Three Million Trees, Three Years initiative as part of this year's independence celebrations. I was preempted um, by our Port Laureate um, this morning. We did indeed receive her um, proposal and it is, I'm happy to report, Mr. President, an initiative that the ministry intends to partner with her on introducing parish trees as a part of the Jamaica 60th celebration. 
This symbolic act will further demonstrate our commitment to the restoration of, of forests. You should know that about 31% of the island is covered by forests, but they are in danger of being lost forever. According to Global Forestry Watch, from the years 2002 to 2020, Jamaica lost 9.87 kHA, that's kilo hectare, of humid primary forest, making up 20% of the island's total tree cover loss in the same time period. Forests provide important source materials for household and industrial products like food, medicines, cosmetics, etc. Forests protect our watershed and reduce soil erosion and siltation in our water as the tree roots hold the soil in place and their canopies help to reduce the force of the raindrops on the soil. This allows water to gradually seep into the ground and recharge the aquifers from which we obtain water. Our forests produce oxygen and absorb carbon dioxide for photosynthesis while reducing the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere which contribute to global warming and climate change. Holders of beach licenses are being reminded to submit their applications for renewal before the March 31, 2022 deadline. For the processing of renewal applications, the licensee is required to submit the completed application form, pay the required application fee, and provide an updated project brief, which will be used to determine whether any operational changes were made since the permit was originally granted. Official copies of company documents, including Certificate of Incorporation and a list of directors, should also be submitted. Please note that a valid government identification is required for the person applying. Caribbean Airlines says it has no immediate plans to raise airfares despite surging oil prices. The increase in the cost of oil, which has been sparked by the Russia-Ukraine conflict, has prompted other international air carriers to hike fares. Caribbean Airlines head of corporate communications, Dion Legore, told Trinidad's Guardian newspaper that while the company had not decided to increase prices, it will continue to closely monitor what is taking place globally. In a recent interview with the BBC, Delta Airlines chief executive officer Ed Bastian said higher oil prices would lead to a 10% increase in fares on the company's domestic flights in the United States. Other airlines, Emirates, Japan Airlines and AirAsia, have also introduced surcharges on fares as a result of increased fuel costs. Let's take a look at the latest market updates in the Business Report with Danita Rodney. In foreign exchange trading for Friday, March 25, the U.S. dollar sold for an average of $154.07. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $122.16. The pound sterling traded for $202.14. And the euro sold for an average of $172.48. The following reflects the movement of the JSE indices in Friday's trading session. The JSE index advanced by 2,067 points to close at over 300,000 units. The junior market index advanced by 101 points to close at over 4,000 units. The combined market index advanced by 2,838 points to close at over 300,000 units. And the All Jamaican Composite Index advanced by 3,161 points to close at over 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 110 stocks, of which 54 advanced, 32 declined, and 24 traded firm. Stocks advanced for Access Financial Services Limited, Barita Investments Limited, and Blue Power Group Limited. 
Stocks declined for AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited, Caribbean Cream Limited, and Siboney Group Limited. Trading firm were 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, 1834 Investments Limited, and Berger Paints Jamaica Limited. Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares was the volume leader with over 10.5 million units, followed by Mailpack Group Limited with over 10 million units and Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with over 4 million units. In regional stocks in Trinidad and Tobago, Clicker Investment Fund was the volume leader with over 512 shares, followed by Calypso Macro Index Fund with 100 shares being traded. The Barbados Stock Exchange saw Epic Caribbean Property Fund Development Fund as the volume leader with over 29,000 shares. They were followed by Government of Barbados Bond Series B with over 10,000 shares and Barbados Farms Limited with over 1,000 shares being traded. The wavering petrol cost continues to cause strife across the region as in news from Antigua and Barbuda, Trade Minister the Honorable E.P. Chet Green has responded to critiques of the government over the recent petrol price increases, insisted the government has kept electricity costs unchanged. With all the noise they make, you don't hear them give government credit where APU has not moved the price of electricity by a cent. Foreign Affairs Minister E.P. Chet Green has hit back at those criticizing the government for the recent increase in petrol prices at the pump. Almost two weeks ago, the price for gasoline and diesel increased by over $3. However, the minister says the government has kept the cost of electricity unchanged. The largest consumer of fuel in this country, APA. Yeah, yes. Okay? The same fuel price that went up. Mm -hmm. The government of Gaston Brown, the Labour Party administration, the party that built this country, the party that locked into the people of this country, did not in any way impact or interfere with the price of fuel. He was speaking on the Brown and Brown weekend radio program. Jessica Russell, ABS News. In market data for oil, oil prices tumbled more on Monday as fears over weaker fuel demand in China grew after lockdown efforts to curb a surge in COVID-19 infections. Brent crude slid $5.97 or 4.9% at $114.68 the barrel and West Texas Intermediate Crude hit a low of $107.97 a barrel down $5.93 or 5.2%. And that was the business report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. In news from across the region, on Saturday, Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister Keith Rowley announced the removal of most COVID-19 restrictions beginning Monday, April 4. The removal includes the government's safe zone arrangements. The decision was made based on data that shows COVID-19 cases and hospitalization declining. We will, as of today, remove much of what we had in place when we were dealing with a more threatening environment in the COVID. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley says this country is in a far better place than it was in November, December, when hospitalizations and COVID-19 cases were showing an upward trajectory. Health officials on Saturday, including Principal Medical Officer Dr. Miriam Abdul-Richard, says hospital occupancies are the lowest it has been for quite a while. This morning, in our hospitals, there are 173 patients and zero patients in our step-down. And for the first time since April of last year, we have zero patients in step-down facilities. And this trend has been consistent over the past 10 days or so. And due to this, Dr. Rowley says on April 4th, safe zones as well as restrictions on rivers and beaches will be removed. He says a level of personal responsibility will now be needed and cautions all citizens to be vigilant. And we're not telling you, don't party, don't have a beer, don't go to a bar. We've passed that stage, we're into another stage now. And that's why the personal responsibility cannot be overstated. Mask wearing will still be in place except for sporting activity, while there will no longer be any limits on public gatherings. He says health officials will continue to monitor the virus, but did not rule out the possibility of any restrictions being re-implemented if the situation changes. If the circumstances change drastically and say, well, you say 
that you could open up and look what you happen, what happened now. I have no crystal ball on this virus. I'm simply going with the data today. Dr. Rowley says all schools will reopen as scheduled, but noted that more information would soon be provided by the Minister of Education. Sonolala, TTT News. Staying in Trinidad and Tobago, citizens are being cautioned about taking photos and videos of police officers while on duty. National Security Minister Fitzgerald Hines says there is no policy or law which prevents citizens from recording officers, but it should be done from a safe distance and should not obstruct the officers while in the execution of their duties. And although it is not illegal, citizens are being cautioned on taking photos and videos of police officers while on duty. National Security Minister Fitzgerald Hines says there is no policy or law which prevents citizens from recording officers, but believes it should be done from a safe distance and should not obstruct the officers while in the execution of their duties. He did, however, note that citizens could be charged with other offences if they are obstructing or found to be harassing members of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. Members of the public will be well advised to note the relevant provisions of the Police Service Act and the Offences Against the Persons Act, both of which I quoted, Madam Speaker, and both of which provide that continuously doing so in a manner described above can amount to harassment and lead to arrest and charges accordingly. In the Bahamas, Sunday marked the end of the Caribbean tour of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. The royals started their tour in Belize on March 19 and ended in the Bahamas on the 27th. Our news has the details. Prince William and Duchess Kate are back home in the UK tonight after saying farewell to the Bahamas on Saturday and boarded the Royal Jet at the Linden Pinling International Airport. The visit to celebrate the Platinum Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II included earlier stops in Belize and Jamaica. The three-day visit to our shores included a stop off to the Sybil Strawn Primary School, a meeting with healthcare workers, and despite a downpour, the Royals enjoyed a junk new parade downtown. Later that night, a state reception. Their departure concluded a busy day with trips to Abaco and Grand Bahama on Saturday. Their Royal Highnesses are back home in Britain this evening, having completed a successful visit to the Bahamas. In Barbados, Prime Minister Mia Motley is of the view that the island's establishment of an embassy in Abu Dhabi will bring economic prosperity and new opportunities for Barbadians. Alia Briggs has that story. Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley remains steadfast in her mission to leverage international opportunities to overcome domestic challenges. She's optimistic the opening of the embassy in Abu Dhabi is a major step in achieving this goal. According to her, Barbados is adopting a new foreign policy which goes beyond North Atlantic relations. We recognize that the North Atlantic approach that had hitherto informed our foreign policy could not be the basis upon which we could go forward. We also recognize that Barbados' voice in regional and multilateral fora must be heard if we are going to be at the table to create the fiscal and policy space that we absolutely need at this time. We would have needed it in good times, but we even more so need it in challenging times. The opening was attended by Foreign Affairs Minister Senator Dr. the Most Honorable Jerome Walcott, Barbados' Ambassador to the United Arab Emirates, His Excellency Gabriel Abed, and other officials. Prime Minister Motley says the shared values between Barbados and the UAE have played a critical role in government's decision to establish the embassy. Our responsibility as leaders is to be able to include each and every one. And you have done it not by talking about it, but you have walked the talk. And in this country, with the 200 nationalities represented here on a day-to-day -day basis, making life easier for their families back home, you have created opportunities and relief for so many millions of people in this world that it became absolutely clear that this was the correct choice for us. 
Dubai has emerged as a global investment hub, and the Prime Minister believes the establishment of the new embassy will bring economic prosperity and new opportunities for Barbadians. We trust and pray, Ambassador, that you and others here, along with Invest Barbados, will be so successful in working with the people and government and those global investors that find themselves in this wonderful hub, global hub, such that we will be able to bring sufficient business to our nation, such that we can bring the prosperity which is at the foundation of all that we do because it takes cash to care. And that if we can do that, then we can rapidly move to phase two of our global foreign policy. Aliyah Briggs, CBC News. In sports, the West Indies completed a comprehensive 10-wicket win over England inside four days in the third and final test match in Grenada to claim the Apex Series 1-0. England resumed yesterday on 103 for 8, leading by just 10 before Kimar Roach snapped up the remaining two wickets to leave England on 120. The Windies wasted little time in reaching the target on 28 without loss. The West Indies women will play the unbeaten Australians in the first semi-final of the ICC Women's World Cup after South Africa dumped India from the contest Saturday night. India batted first, reaching a com competitive 274 for seven with Simiti Mangdana top scoring with 71 and Mathali Raj getting 68. The Proteas women reached 275 for five in their 50 overs with Laura Wolvart contributing 88. Meanwhile, in other preliminary games, uh, England made light work of Bangladesh, beating them by 100 ones to qualify for the semis. Scores in that game, England 234 for 6, Bangladesh 134. The Windies will take on the Aussies around 5 p.m. Tuesday, Jamaica time. And with that, we call an end to today's newscast. On behalf of our entire news production team, thank you so much for watching PBCJ. Remember, we are the People's Station.